The past couple years have seen massive jumps in CPU performance. We've seen 4-core 8-thread processors like the older Core i7s being considered a high-end CPU just three years ago to now being an entry-level processor around the 100 US dollar mark with the release of the new Core i3 10th gen lineup from Intel as well as AMD's new Ryzen 3 lineup. And while newer processors are always nice, technology is advancing fast and getting cheaper over time, some people are going to be stuck with a 10 plus year old system. And in that 10 year old system, you may find a dual core processor. And no, I'm not talking about one of the older Core i3s that had two cores and four threads. I'm talking about a processor with two cores and two threads. But anybody who's running a 10 year old system with a dual core processor may still wonder how their dual core performs in modern titles in 2020. Well, I also had that same curiosity when I stumbled upon a processor that met those same requirements. Meet the Pentium G3258. This little guy released in 2014 in the Haswell family architecture, the same family that the Core i7-4790K released in. And this little guy only has two cores and two threads with a base clock of 3.2 gigahertz. And even at the time in 2014, this was considered a low-end processor. But today we'll be pairing it against the Core i7-4790K as well as the Core i7-2600K. Now I understand both of those processors are far more powerful than the little dual core Pentium that we have here. But my thinking behind it is, if you are running a dual core processor, what is going to be a cheap upgrade option for you? And well, the Core i7-2600 non-K can be found on eBay for about 50 to 60 US dollars. And if you have a compatible motherboard, it's a simple drop in upgrade. But let's say you don't have a compatible motherboard. Let's say you're actually running the same Pentium G3258 here. This little guy is only going to run on motherboards that support 4th gen processors. So to get a compatible motherboard, it's only going to cost you another 50 to 60 US dollars. And in total, you're looking at about 100 to 120 dollars for this upgrade. And to be honest, it's going to be the best bang for the buck performance wise you can get because for 100 to 120 dollars, you'd only be able to purchase a processor in the new i3 10th gen lineup or AMD's new Ryzen 3 lineup. So it's a fantastic bargain. Now, I do understand that there are used Core i5s on the market, but the price difference between getting a used Core i5 and a used i7-2600 is only going to be about 10 to 20 dollars depending on what you're looking at. And the performance difference between the two, it's going to be massive in newer titles. Quad core i5s are starting to struggle a lot in modern titles, with the 1% load especially being bad, which means you're getting large stutters. So I would highly suggest in 2020 getting a quad core with hyper threading at the absolute minimum. And that's where the i7-2600 comes in. So let's talk about the test bench. The i7-2600K was paired with an ASRock Z77 motherboard. Both the i7-4790K and Pentium G3258 were paired with an MSI Z970S crate motherboard. All CPUs were cooled with a Cryorig H7 air cooler. All were tested with 16 gigs of 1600 MHz DDR3 memory, a GTX 980 Ti, and all of that was powered by a 1000 watt EVGA gold power supply. So the benchmarks today are gonna be a little bit different. Because of how low-end this processor is, I figured showing some live gameplay would be beneficial to show some of the issues that I encountered while testing. So I have the normal graphs, but afterwards for each game we're going to be looking at some in-game performance with a couple notes. The graphs also have some more information on them now. I've added the release year for each title that we are testing, as well as the graphics API I used to test. This information will hopefully provide some insight on how newer titles using newer graphics APIs are utilizing the hardware. The trend should be newer APIs like DirectX 12 and Vulkan should see more even utilization across more cores, which should reflect in better performance in games. It's gonna be more relevant when I start testing with CPUs that have more than four cores and eight threads, but I figured it wouldn't hurt to add that information now. CSGO is up first and looking okay. We see on average 127 FPS with a 1% low of 65. Honestly, it's not terrible. It stays above 60 FPS, so I'd consider that good enough to play. Something we need to watch out for though is frame time performance. So, if you were unaware, frame time performance is how long each frame takes to render. The higher the FPS, the lower each frame will take to render. We can see a visualization of frame time performance with the long jittery line that you can see here. I'll have this up in the top left hand corner for all gameplay clips. If there is stuttering in a game, you can see spikes in the frame time line. In CSGO, there wasn't terrible stuttering. I think my horrible gameplay was from the Amazon Basics mouse I was using instead of the actual game stutter. Overall, CSGO on the Pentium is okay. 
Taking a look at Devil May Cry 5 may give you the impression it's playable with over 60 FPS on average. The problem is with the 1% low and the large gap between your average FPS and that 1% low. The large gap shows bad stuttering in the game. If we look at the gameplay, the frame time graph is not a smooth line, which is what it should be. It's jumping all over the place, which during gameplay feels awful. It's almost like you're lagging in game. Now, 60 FPS may be off the table, but what about locking to 30 FPS? When locking the frame rate to 30 FPS using MSI Afterburner, we do see a smooth 30 FPS with no drops during the benchmark. While 30 FPS isn't great to play at, at least it's playable with no stutter. So worst case scenario, you become a console gamer. Battlefield 1 is the worst game tested so far. During the benchmark run, we saw CPU usage staying consistently at 100% and we could barely keep 30 FPS on average. So, locking to 30 FPS was pretty much off the table. But, Battlefield 1 is also a multiplayer game, so what if we jumped into a multiplayer match? 30 FPS is playable, right? And we almost got that on average. Well, unfortunately, Battlefield 1 has 64 player multiplayer matches, which adds even more strain on the CPU than the AI did in the single player levels. So, what we saw was a slideshow. Normally, any other processor with more than two cores would not see as heavy of a hit to CPU performance as the Pentium does. This is due to having more cores to run background tasks and split up workloads. But on the dual core Pentium we have here, there's only two cores that are trying to do everything. So it's just too much for this little guy to handle and Battlefield 1 is not playable. Let's jump into some battle royales. First up is Fortnite. While we did get 60 FPS again on average, that 1% low tells us it's not very pleasant. Fortnite also suffers from pretty terrible stuttering. The CPU is constantly hitting 100% usage, so let's try dropping the frame rate to 30 FPS. And for the most part, it's much better. But like I had mentioned before, occasionally we do get some spikes, but even when we got frame time spikes, I was still able to hit my shots pretty consistently. Though. A warning, there are larger spikes that do freeze the game for a split second that could be very dangerous in a firefight. A more graphically advanced battle royale is Warzone. I was honestly surprised this game even launched, let alone got over 30 FPS most of the time. But again, looking at the game performance, the frame time and CPU usage were just too much to handle 60 FPS in this title. And when locking to 30 FPS, while it was smoother, it still suffered the occasional frame time spike that felt pretty awkward when playing. If you really wanted to play Warzone though, you could, it just wouldn't be a very good experience. Another surprise was PUBG. Now this game is still pretty much unoptimized garbage, but it did manage to almost reach 60 FPS on our dual core. These large player count games are not pulling any punches for the little Pentium here. And again, frame times and CPU usage were just too high in PUBG, so let's try capping the FPS to 30. And here, just like in Warzone, we see some stuttering when locked to 30 FPS. This game also suffered larger frame time spikes, kind of like Fortnite, that would freeze the game for a split second, which is not great for a fast-paced multiplayer game. I'm just gonna touch on Rainbow Six Siege real quick. Obviously you can see this game would launch and I could play around in the settings, but once I tried to load any game, it would crash. And it crashed both in DX11 and Vulcan. I was worried more games would suffer this game's fate, but I'm pleasantly surprised more games launched on the dual core Pentium, even if the frame rates weren't fantastic. But at least they still played, unlike Siege. Project Cars 2 is the only racing game I tested and this is a decent experience. The graph tells a different story than what I actually experienced during gameplay. I never felt a drop to 30 FPS, and the average FPS felt like it was around 70 most of the time. If you are more sensitive than I am to frame time stuttering, I did try locking the 30 FPS. And looking at the gameplay, it was smooth. The smoothest game I tested yet. The CPU was at 100% usage the entire time, but I never felt like that hurt the experience, so I'm very, very happy with the performance we got in Project Cars 2 on the Dual Core Pentium. The last game to look at is the very demanding Witcher 3. Big yikes on this one. Yes, the game played, and it played well. A log 30 FPS looks possible here, but oh wait, 
Where's the 1% low on the graph? Nope, I didn't forget it. It's literally less than one FPS. So this game had the worst freezing out of any game tested so far. It regularly would stop the game for a couple seconds before continuing. While the game is well optimized, it's still too much for the little dual core Pentium. I believe the freezing in this title is from assets being decompressed and streamed in when loading into a new level or just walking through a town. So here's a warning. Future games are implementing more and more asset streaming technology into their titles, so if The Witcher 3 is anything to go by, I'd expect dual cores to not even be able to play new titles in the near future, and probably quad cores are soon to follow. So start saving up, because it's only going to get worse. Now I kind of threw in Cinebench here for the lols, but oh wait, the dual core Pentium is half the speed of the i7-2600K, so what's going on here? Well, the Pentium is from the same architecture as the i7-4790K, and if we do some math and divide the 4790K's result by what the Pentium's result was, it's about 25% of the score when the Pentium only has 25% of the cores, so it adds up. The reason it's so close to the i7-2600K in Cinebench though, is the architectural improvements and IPC gains that we got from the Pentium being on a smaller process than the i7-2600K. Still, that doesn't mean that the Pentium is almost half the speed in gaming of the i7-2600K. That's definitely not what we found. Newer titles are starting to use more cores and you just don't get playable experience on a dual core processor anymore. So to sum everything up from today, I'm surprised that more games launched on the Duke or Pentium than not. I was expecting a lot more games to crash or refuse to run kind of like Siege did, but I'm pleasantly surprised that they didn't. Now, the Core i7-2600 non-K again is only about 50 to 60 US dollars on the used market. For some people, that's a week's worth of Starbucks. For some, on a tighter budget though, it's saving a dollar a day for two months. And Honestly, you're not going to find a better price to performance on the used market than the 2600 right now. And considering that the i7-2600K, the one we tested here today, was getting about 144 FPS in most of the titles tested, the i7-2600 non-K, the one that I'm suggesting getting, is only going to be about 5-10% to slower than that. So it's an absolute steal. And I would think that quad-core i5s, the processors I'm not suggesting getting, are probably going to start performing like the dual core Pentium that we have here over the next coming years with newer titles. Reason being is that the newer consoles are releasing with 8 core 16 thread processors in them, so I'd expect games on PC to start requiring more cores as well. So you might get titles that run extremely poorly on a quad core processor, or possibly even refuse to run at all. So again, I highly suggest getting a quad core with hyper threading at the absolute minimum right now. If you have the available budget, Go for a processor with more cores. Chances are it'll last you a lot longer. But that's all for this video today. So if you liked the video, hit the like button down below. Hit subscribe if you want to see more content from me in the future. Hit the bell icon next to that to get notified when I release new content. I have some really cool projects in the work right now, uh, and one specifically being a series that's going to run the entire lifespan of my channel and will be evolving over the years. So stay tuned for that because I'm excited for it. But yeah. That's all for today, and thanks for watching.